Uh, joining us now is Natasha Hausdorff. She's a legal director at the UK Lawyers for Israel. She is a, a barrister and also an expert in international law. Very useful to have you here uh, today, Natasha, on a day when there's talk about, you know, whether or not the Israelis have broken international law. It's rather obvious that Hamas have with that horrific massacre. More and more, I mean, just horrific um, stomach-churning details coming out about what was done to innocent civilians, elderly babies, children, families, on that day, on October the 7th. Um, just speaking specifically to what Antonio Guterres, the UN Secretary General, has said, just first of all, he says, he says the attacks by Hamas didn't happen in a vacuum. Uh, and when you look at the 56 years of suffocating occupation, is he basically saying that there is some, although he says it wasn't a justification for what happened on October the 7th, that it is offering a, a reason for it, if not a justification for it? Well, it does uh, appear that he is seeking to rationalise this appalling slaughter. I think you're absolutely uh, correct about that. Now, uh, we all, of course, want to see peace and a cessation of violence, but these calls only encourage uh, further terrorism and the targeting of Israeli civilians by Iranian terror proxies. Uh, so Guterres should resign. These comments render him unfit to stay in office. And anyone who calls for a ceasefire before Hamas is destroyed is responsible for more deaths that will uh, inevitably occur. I I'm sure that many people have the best of intentions here and that they do not realize the consequence of these actions, which are playing in to the hands of Hamas, just like every previous occasion. Well, this when is the thing. I mean, Britain and the US have said that they, they would like a pause in, in action to make, get aid to civilians in Gaza, um, particularly if, you know, help to the hospitals and the like, and, and water in. But that's very different from a ceasefire, isn't it? Because, as you say, a ceasefire would benefit Hamas. They're the ones now under attack. And and also, to all intents and purposes, I mean, the reason why they took the hostages, it would appear, would be to try and prevent there being some sort of ground invasion and this sort of attack. The reason why they don't want civilians to leave northern Gaza is so that there will be civilian deaths so that they can urge the international community to call a ceasefire. That would be playing into Hamas's tactics. You're absolutely right, and that is the motivation uh, for the war crimes that Hamas has committed, as well as uh, its genocidal intent towards Jews. Uh, but more than um, uh, these issues, I, I think it's important to recognise that Israel has been prevented from removing the threat uh, in 2008, in 2012, in 2014, in 2021. Uh, after each of those ceasefires, things got worse. And these calls for further ceasefires, is it a case simply where Israel ceases and Hamas fires? Because this is what we have been seeing repeatedly. Uh, yesterday in the Lords, I thought it was important that Lord Verderami um, stated that asking a state uh, to act uh, in this fashion uh, is um, asking it to uh, give up its lawful defensive objectives uh, and give up before those have been met. It's simply asking a state to stop defending itself, and, mm. and that is inexcusable. Well, this is the thing. We, we, there's a lot of talk about the rules of war, and, and while everyone will say... Well, actually, not everyone. We've had people celebrating the horrific events on October the 7th, but most right-thinking people will say, you know, of course what Hamas did, they're a terrorist group. What Hamas did was inexcusable, unacceptable, uh, or clearly, uh, you know, a, a, a crime. However... There are also a lot of people claiming um, that what Israel is doing in response, not just the cutting off of the, the, the food and water and fuel uh, to civilians in, uh, in, in Gaza in an attempt to cut it off to, to Hamas, is a war crime, is against international law. It's mass punishment with airstrikes. Um, do you believe that there are, as Antonio Guterres says, clear violations of international humanitarian law in Gaza? Absolutely not. Uh, the only violations of humanitarian law are those that Hamas is uh, perpetrating, not just against Israelis, but against its own people in Gaza. Um, and in fact, we've had reports that I can see now of aerial photographs of Hamas-controlled oil tanks in Gaza, uh, which were reportedly being withheld from hospitals by Hamas as a means of applying similar international pressure uh, on Israel. So they're using that fuel for their terror infrastructure and withholding it from hospitals. Uh, and the UN as a whole uh, has a complicity in these crimes. We saw two weeks ago a tweet by UNRWA uh, that confirmed Hamas had stolen from it 24,000 litres of fuel. That tweet was subsequently deleted. So it's not just yeah. uh, Antonio Guterres, but the UN administration and UN bodies that are complicit, it seems, in many of these atrocities.
What is the midway point? Because I think most people would say they still don't want the people of Gaza, the civilians, particularly when half the population is our children, to, to suffer in this way. When we've seen you know, the order, that evacuation order, um, again, we're going to be bombing where Hamas are and the tunnels are. You need to get out of northern Gaza, bearing in mind the Israelis have also had an evacuation order for northern Israel for people who are at risk of airstrikes from Hezbollah in the north. Um, but they asked people to move south. But there is still bombing by Israel in the south of the country. That doesn't tie in at all with Israel's war aims when they talk about, you know, wanting to take on Hamas in the north. You can't order people to evacuate from one part of the country to another that's safe and then bomb that part of the country. Well, let me be clear that Israel doesn't have the power to order uh, anyone in Gaza to do everything. This is to do anything. This is part of the reason that Hamas have, over the last 16 years, built this terror infrastructure there uh, with which to pursue their genocidal aims. But what Israel has done, just like any law abiding state, is provide warnings mm -hmm. of the strikes that it is taking. Those strikes are assessed under the principles of international law, importantly, the principle of proportionality, uh, to make sure that civilian lives are saved to the utmost, quite the contrary of Hamas's behavior. But I think I do need to stress here that um, what we have been seeing, uh, I think, comes down to a failure to stand up to the demands of the international community. World pressure has ultimately caused Israel to make dangerous security concessions over the last 20 years that have led to this atrocity. And one example of this is in relation to work permits for Palestinians to enter Israel. Between uh, January and August this year, there were 400,000 entries from Gaza into Israel, mostly Palestinians coming to work in Israel. And this played a significant role in Hamas's planning and gathering of specific, detailed, family-based information, intelligence uh, about their targets across 30 uh, sites in the south of Israel. These terrorists, Julia, came armed with exact maps detailing um, communities, households, how many people, how many children per family, and what they were instructed to do to them. And so much of this is uh, linked back to the sort of international pressure, uh, the misrepresentation of history and the misrepresentation of international law that we have seen. I um, can give one example. No, do yes. continue. Yes, please. Well, if I give one example of Ophir Lipstein, who was in charge of the regional uh, council in Sha'ar HaNegev, he led a project for the Arazim Industrial Zone to provide 10,000 jobs for Palestinians from Gaza and renewable energy for the Gaza Strip, a, a program for fresh water with pipes that Hamas uprooted for their rocket manufacture. On the 7th of October, he was murdered by Palestinian terrorists along with other members of his, his family. A man who dedicated his life to helping Gazan civilians was slaughtered. Yep. Uh, and one example, that's only one example of Israelis okay. um, bending over backwards to support Gaza and paying with their blood. You mentioned the term proportionality, and that's been quite a big issue over the last week about what is proportional when we've seen, for instance, the number of uh, deaths claimed by Hamas. And again, a lot of people say, well, these are coming from aid agencies and the UN, and they're verified. But of course, they come from hospitals which are under the control of Hamas. We have to, you know, point out that we, don't, we cannot independently really confirm this. And the talk also of self-defence and whether or not what Israel is doing right now is legitimately self-defence or is it revenge? Now, I'm personally of the view that when you've had your civilians, population slaughtered in the way they have, I'm not entirely sure that revenge isn't an appropriate response personally. Um, but in terms of international law, as a legal expert, what, what would dictate what would count as proportionality and what would count as an act of self-defence as opposed to an offensive act by Israel? Well, Israel is permitted to act uh, in so far as it is necessary to pursue the military objective of uh, getting rid of Hamas and ensuring that nothing like this can ever happen so anything, again. Anything is any any anything that is necessary well, to do that would be allowed. Let, let, if I can finish, the first qualifier is that it is necessary um, to achieve a legitimate military objective of acting in self-defense. Uh, then the second principle of international law is that Israel is required to distinguish between uh, civilian objects, protected objects and combatants, which it does uh, uh, routinely. And this is a matter of public record. Any international lawyer and military uh, expert uh, worth their salt will recognize this. Uh, that is also, I, I should stress, um, apparent from the statistics of previous exchanges, the, according to the United Nations, the global combatant to civilian ratio uh, with conflicts around the world is nine uh, to one. That's a disturbing nine civilians uh, killed for every one combatant. In the last Israeli operation in Janine, uh, only uh, several months ago, 
uh, the ratio was 0.6 civilians to every one combatant, so more combatants killed than civilians. And you're absolutely right in uh, respect of the numbers that are coming out of the Hamas-controlled Ministry of Health. This is Hamas propaganda. They do not distinguish between combatants and civilians, whereas Israel does. And that reflects the third principle that it adheres to, and that is proportionality. This is not a numbers game. It is not about weighing up deaths on each side. Proportionality requires Israel to consider each strike through its legal team uh, within the army, in the military advocate general call, uh, that it sits outside of the military command. And they assess the proportionality of each strike by weighing up the anticipated military advantage against the anticipated collateral damage, harm to civilians. And in doing so, they are recognized as going over and above the requirements of the laws of armed conflict. Because in addition to uh, the, their proportionality assessment, they issue warnings of their strikes. Mm -hmm. Warnings that give Hamas tip-offs, of course, as to where they will be focusing their strikes on Hamas terrorist infrastructure, as well as the civilians. But the focus from uh, the citizen army of the IDF, a democratic state where the decisions of uh, the army and strikes are subject to accountability, through the courts, through a uh, very active NGO scene. We have seen through every previous military operation that Israel okay. doesn't just adhere to the laws of armed conflict, but sets a standard that very few armies uh, are and, around and the world. And indeed, um, much public scrutiny within Israel as well. It's been an absolute pleasure having your company. Really appreciate you joining us, your time and your expertise. Natasha Hausdorff, she's legal director at UK Lawyers for Israel International.